And the thing that, that always surprised me is that a God who has no beginning would say there is a beginning. Right. And for the first time of uh, 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 ever that's ever been, we see that God states that there is a time. There's a calculation that time is passing. And beginning is nothing to us. There was a the beginning of the service. There was a the beginning of the day. There was a the beginning of this and the beginning of that. It's all the time. It's everywhere. We say it every day. But for God himself to say beginning, it means that something new has started that never was before. And so God creates time, basically, when he says in the beginning. And then it says God created the heaven and the earth. And you'll read throughout the rest of this chapter how God in His wisdom and through His Word, which is of course Jesus Christ, creates light and land and water and seas and animals and plants and all of these things. And so we have God before man can ever have a communication with God whatsoever. There must be a time and a place. And so what He has created here for us is a time and a place. Yeah. Natural man is born on the, the sixth day, right? He's created by God on, on the sixth day. And he's given this very special thing that nobody else is given before or after. And that is the Spirit of God breathes into him and he becomes a living soul. And all the animals don't get all this. But greater than that, God has given him this burden of being made in his image. And so now we have God who is invisible and cannot be seen, but is seen through man. And the whole revelation of God to creation is seen in man as man walks around and does what he does. And what a burden that would be to somehow display the invisible God through visible flesh and visible man. But that's man's first commandment that he's given by God. And he goes on and he works and does this and, 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 and does that and all the other stuff that he's given to do. But it all pales in comparison to being the image bearer of God. And fallen man is a terrible image bearer of God. And saved man is, at the best he can do, still falls short, right? But let's not ever forget that in the beginning we were created to do this one thing. And that is to display God and his attributes and his characteristics that he gave us so that we could show them to others. Now, if you look on in chapter 2 and verse 9... It says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He puts two special trees in this garden. Verse 8, And the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. All the other creation seems like it's just broadcast out. But here it says he planted a garden. He sets it in order. He makes a pattern. He makes something that's recognizably different from all the rest of it. Amen. You can go in the woods and you can say moss is probably going to grow on the north side of a tree. You can say the evergreens grow more on the cold side and all the other hardwoods grow on the hot side. You can do all that and you say all you want to say. But when you take a walk through the woods, you find out that trees just grow wherever trees grow. But when you enter the garden, God had a pattern laid out in that garden that Adam understood this is the place where God and I meet. And they fell him, right? They eat the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. And now they're sinners before God. They've broken his commandment. But somehow, some way, they have figured out that God visits this garden at a certain time. Yeah. Right? And so all the time that they're sowing the fig leaves and all the time that they're hiding in the trees, what they're doing is making a preparation because they know that the faithfulness of God, he'll be here. Right. And I think that every now and then we come into the house of God thinking, I wonder if God is here. Adam and Eve, though they were sinners, didn't have that question. They prepared themselves. It was a weak preparation. It was just fig leaves. It wasn't good enough to cover them. They didn't have the blood. But they did what they could to get ready for God because God was faithful to show up to them. And now you can say all that you want, that God's presence is everywhere, and it's right. God's presence is everywhere. If life exists, then God exists. And if, if, if God is gone, then life is gone because He is life. And I understand all that. But the fact is that God has always, throughout history, made a place, a specific place, where He can dwell with man and meet with man. And the thing is, we can look at the sunrise and we can say, I see the glory of God. But until you've ever met Him spirit to spirit, until the Holy Ghost has ever revealed God to you, you ain't never really met Him. And so the whole earth, sure, is full of his glory. But as we go on, you'll find that 
it almost leaves this notion. The Bible leaves this notion in a way, and we get to this idea of lineage, and this begats that, and that begats that, and we go on down, we've got these chosen people, but finally, when you get to the end of all of this, you've got the children of Israel coming up out of Egypt, right? Yeah. And so they're they're under bondage, and God, de <coughs> and God delivers them, and they come up out of the land, and the Egyptians are drowned in the sea, right? Yeah. He parts the seas, and he drowns the Egyptians. Yes. And on the other side, you would think that all of these Israelites would say, we now know that the God of Moses is the God of all the earth. Right. But Moses is up on the mountain a very short number of days until they say, as for this Moses, we don't know what's to come of him. Aaron, take the gold. Pull, pull out your earrings. We've gone long enough without a God that we can see. We're going to have to have a God that we can see. And he throws in a, out comes a cow. The Egyptians saw the waters parted. And Israel saw the waters part. The Egyptians saw the plague. And Israel saw the plague. And the Egyptians saw Pharaoh drown. And the, and the Israelites saw him drown. Just because God reveals a miracle does not mean that he's revealed himself. And the problem is, in our day and time, we're looking for all sorts of signs to prove that God is real. Look at scientists. Oh, if you could just prove that God was real by the rocks in the in the ground or by the fossils that we pull up, then we would believe Him. Hogwash! They started out their search by not believing God to begin with. And everything else they discovered, they put into those categories of God doesn't exist, so all this means something else. Man is not after God. He does not want to know God because if there is a God, then He is holy. And if He is holy, then we are sinners before Him and we are in judgment before Him. We hate judgment. Man hates judgment. Yes, they do. That's right. But then God does this amazing thing in the desert for Israel and only Israel. He tells Moses, there's ten commandments. And I want you all to do these things because I need you all to get along for a while until I do the rest of this. And then He goes about and He tells him how to build the temple, right? And in this temple or tabernacle, you've got this big outer ring and you've got this building in the middle of it and you've got this first room that you go into and there's a showbread and the candlesticks and all these other things and the altar of incense. And if you go on past that, there's the Holy of Holies. And God is saying, of all the places of all the world, I have picked above this mercy seat for me to dwell myself. Right. And they look. And because maybe because they're ignorant, maybe because God just wanted to show himself this way. And in the daytime, they see there's a pillar of smoke. And at nighttime, they see a pillar of fire. And they can say God is above that place. But just because God is above that place doesn't mean they know who he is. They made a cow. They murmur against him. They know his works, but they don't know him. And so they come into this temple or this tabernacle, and they bring an animal. And the priest is there, Right? And the priest is supposed to understand the ways of God, the way that God has revealed himself to Israel. The priest is supposed to understand this. Right. And he says, you come over here and we'll kill this animal and we'll have the blood shed. And you will know that the sacrifice for your sin is death, but this animal will pay that price for you for a little while. And then sometimes they bring incense and all this, and I really don't understand all the different offerings of that. But only if you are an Israelite can you come into the tabernacle or can you come into the congregation, the outer ring, and only if you're a priest can you go into the tabernacle, and only if you're the high priest can you ever get to the Holy of Holies. Yeah. And then one day Jesus went that veil, right? That's right. To the Holy of Holies. How is it that we do not recognize that this house provided that we are in the right pattern that God showed us, is that place. Right. It is that holy of holies that nobody else could ever get into. You think of all the priests of Israel, I wonder how many of them ever got to walk in to the holy of David didn't get to do it. No. Abraham never seen it. Moses didn't go in. Aaron went into it, right? Only a select few ever got to go there. But somehow we cross the threshold of the house of God without a thought in our mind that we've entered into a holy place prepared for God and man to dwell together. And I think that we do it out of ignorance sometimes. But look at this temple. How intricate is it? Have you ever read it? You can't read it, right? You can't even understand it. You got loops and, and you got and you got and you got curtains and you got this kind of weaving and this kind of tapestries and you got all these kind of workings of metal and workings of art and all this stuff that goes into the temple. You can't even imagine it as you read it. That's for God to just say, listen, I am a very particular God. Right. I want it done right. I'm not afraid to tell you what is right. The problem is, you're not willing to go the extra effort to make it right. The thing, I don't know if you've ever been into a, 
uh, Catholic church, but the one thing that the Catholics have got right is they build a sense of awe into their synagogues. And I've never been into one except for one time here, here in, in America, and it wasn't all that impressive. But I've been into some in the year where you'll stare up three stories into a vaulted ceiling. And if you've got a pair of binoculars and you look in the farthest corner of the farthest, darkest place of the whole church, and somebody's carved an angel, or somebody's carved a, a butterfly, or, or carved a flower, because they were willing to say all the way up in the darkest corner of this place is worth our time to make it beautiful. So that man could be inspired with a sense of awe when he comes into the house of God. Amen. Amen. I, know that our, I know that our dwellings are much more plain than that. We don't have to have an elaborate dwelling to understand that God is here. But we ought to have elaborate lives. We ought to have specific lives. When we get up in the morning, we ought to have a purpose that we go through. We ought to read the Word of God so that we understand what's right and wrong and we ought to do our best to learn it because man cannot just dream up God in his mind and say God likes this or God likes that. We've got to go to his Word. We do not have another foundation that teaches us how to serve him. Amen. Amen. That's good, Aaron. And so, if the temple was that complicated, Hebrews chapter 12, if the, if, if the tabernacle was that complicated, <coughs> did you ever read about Solomon? And David, he, he's getting ready to build the Lord a house. Right. And he's got these work crews. I'm talking hundreds of hundreds of people. Just let's just get let's just get all the materials here. Solomon's gonna build a house. I'm not gonna be able to do it, but I'm gonna gather up the materials for it. <coughs> it's a whole undertaking just to get the materials right. to build the temple. And then they build the temple. And when Solomon blesses it. God once again puts his in that temple and he fills it with smoke. And the people can't minister. The, the priests can't the priest can't offer the offering because the smoke is so thick they can't work. It staggers them. They're in the presence of God in such a way that it does not allow them to just do their normal everyday job as a priest. But it seems like that we can come into the house of God and talk about everything under the sun and it doesn't bother us. I'm guilty. I'm guiltier than y'all are, most likely. I understand here that when you come into the house of God, all your friends are here. And it is good for us to have fellowship. And I ask, how's your how's your mother? How's your kid? How's this one that was sick? I pray for this. I mean, I, we, we should do that. That's all right to do that. But I know that there that that, that there's a, a, a way at Antioch that we know the service has started, right? There's a sign. Brother Jason walks up behind this pulpit and he yells, Praise the Lord! Right? And at that point in time, everybody knows the world has ended and the house of God has begun. But I don't think that we make that transition in our mind. I think our bodies make it. I think that we come up in the choir and um, having been in the choir for many years, I realize that there's all sorts of craziness going on in the pews while the choir's singing, right? Well, the choir's not up there to waste their breath. Choir's up there because they want you to hear the songs of Zion and to bring you into a place of worship before a holy God. That's what they're up there for. Your song leaders are picking songs. Your choirs are standing up to sing. And if we're not careful, we'll become like the big churches. We'll have praise teams and all sorts of other, all sorts of other things that everybody just stands and watches. But the house of God is not a place for us to stand and watch. It's a place for us to participate. The choir is here so that you will sing along with them. Amen. They're lifting up their voices so that you will hear the songs and the words and you'll be reminded of God and, and, and then the blood and Jesus and all of this. And all of this is done for you. Right. But we just sit in the pews, don't we? All lazy life. Chasing around our kids. And I know you got to deal with kids. That ain't what I'm trying to say. Flipping through song books. Thinking about everything in the world. Hoping that maybe out of nowhere God's going to come and find you in your rebellious state and smite you with the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah. Right? That's what we're waiting on. God shout me. God let me run. God let me cry. What are you doing? Right. What are you doing? Your mind ain't even here. My mind ain't even in the building. And we've come into a holy place and God ordained it to be so. But we are so eager in our minds that we cannot ever get our minds concentrated enough to say, stop the world. This is a worship house. Amen. And so I want to come into the house of God very carefully. 
I've tried to do this lately and I have failed at it. I'm just going to tell you. But I want to be able to do that, to come into this house as if I have passed between the profane and the worldly into the holy presence of God. Yeah. Now we sometimes will say things like, I didn't feel God. But we have proof that God is faithful. Which means that even if you don't feel Him, He is still there. You are still here for a purpose. I am going to sing in the choir when I don't feel it and when I do feel it. I'm going to lift up my hands from the pews when I do feel it and when I don't feel it. Because he said we're two or three together together, there am I in the midst of him. He said, I am with you always. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. If you have the Spirit of God, you can't go in this house and not be with him. The problem is we get so trusting in emotions and all these other things and we're thinking, I'm just going to sit here until God comes by. Does he get to do all the work? I'm lazy. I don't know if y'all are, but I'm lazy. Hebrews 12. You remember how scary it was, how the mountain was that day when God gave the commandments? He gave the commandments that one day he would say, this is only a shadow of the real thing. But in the day that he gave those commandments, if an animal got close to the mountain, he was to be killed. If a man got close to the mountain, he was to be stoned. They had to set borders around it. Right here is the place where I'm giving Moses the commandments and you can't come up here, people. Right. It is that serious. But the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 12, verse 18, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, Amen. that burned with fire, nor unto dark blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated the words should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Right. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the holy city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, Amen. to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel so the Holy Ghost moved on the waters it is the power with which God created the earth Jesus was the word that was spoken and the Holy Ghost was the power that makes his creative actions happen. God told Moses the pattern, but he didn't say Moses built the pattern. He said, I put my spirit, the spirit of wisdom, and cunningness and craftiness, and I can't remember the man's name, into this man. In other words, he said, this man has been moved upon by the Holy Ghost to have the ability to make the things that I call out to be made in my people. And that guy gathered together with other people who had that very same spirit to be able to craft the place to make it right where it was at. We were lost without God. The Holy Ghost moved upon Mary and she could see. And a virgin born a baby into this world who was the Son of God. The Holy Ghost orchestrates the time and the place that man can dwell together. He creates it and makes it. And when we come into this place, we're going to have to recognize that we're coming into a holy place. And I think it will change our worship. And I think it will change our conversation for the service. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm probably more guilty than you all. But if we're ever going to have revivals, like weeks of revivals, we're going to learn how to have church first. And how do you expect us to ever have a revival if we can't just have a regular old church? But it's hardest on the kids, I think. You're used to it, right? You grew up in it. It's just this. If you're here all the time, right? You feel like you're here all the time. You're not really here all the time. But you feel like you're here all the time. I'm always going to church. I'm always sitting in the pews. And somehow you've got to grow out of that place where you're just an innocent bystander running around, rolling under the pews, and calling the crayon, and doing all the things the kids do. And somehow you all have got to grow into the place where you are one of the people that come into the world. That's right. And if you adults don't provide them an example of how to do that, they're never going to learn. And um, so let's, let's be very specific about how we approach the house of God. 
Let's recognize that the mountain was scary and that man should be killed as they approached it. But now we are given freely the ability to enter into the Holy of Holies. The presence of the Holy Ghost, the presence of a Holy God made available for man to fellowship with. You can't get this out in the world. And you know how people say, I can find the hole on the mountain that you can. You can if you find it here first. I'm not saying you've got to come to church to find the presence of God, but I'm saying the people who find God on the mountain found Him first in the house of God. That's right. And after that, then we leave, and then we find Him in our prayer closets and in the barns. and all. We find Him all sorts of places after that. Amen. But the place where the Word is proclaimed is where we first find God. This has to be the pillar and ground of the truth. This has to be approached with holiness, separation, sanctification, and a mind that's made up to worship God. And anything else will fall short of this.